Thank you for joining us on this series of Psalms. We're in Psalm 37 today, and I just want to let you know how grateful I am uh, that you would take the time to be with me today and to hear the things that the Holy Spirit has put on my heart. And I know that today is going to be a really deep and real, possibly even life-changing encouragement to you. We need encouragement today in the world that we live in, and I just pray that uh, your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit would be <clears throat> built up and lifted up to great heights today. We're going to be looking at Psalm 37. Before we go there, if you wouldn't mind maybe me just taking a moment, I'm not trying to advertise for my own sake, but just hopefully for your blessing and benefit if this Psalm series has been somewhat of an encouragement to you. <clears throat> uh, we put the first volume together. We're doing uh, 12 volumes of 12 chapters each of getting up to Psalm 149 and 150. We'll have, Lord willing, <clears throat> Uh, Shadi Terry will get through all this series, but <clears throat> the first volume has just been released. It's called The Altar of Our Hearts. It's Psalms 1 through 12. It's an expository devotional of the Psalms, and we pray that this would be uh, inspirational and as you look at devotionally <clears throat> getting into these Psalms. You ready to dig into Psalm 37 with me? I, I pray so. Let's let's read the first four verses, or five, first four verses, and then I want to pray. And it's a long chapter, so we'll take some time to work through it. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Holy Spirit, come, speak, minister. I know there are people that are listening to this word today that need a breakthrough. They, they, they need a release. They need to be able to uh, stand strong in the midst of the storms that are around them, the persistent, consistent storms. We thank you that you're going to give us a word today that will uh, bless our hearts and encourage our minds to, to continue on with joy in the midst of all kinds of trials and tribulations. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, titling this, this message, I'm Still Standing. Uh, through the trials, through the pain, through the tribulations, through the onslaught of the enemy. The child of God, this chapter speaks to us, that is, is one who will continue to be standing. <clears throat> the, this is one of the, maybe the richest, fullest, and certainly one of the longer uh, uh, of the Psalms. <clears throat> there, there's, there's so much packed into it. <clears throat> but what I take most from it is that it's, it's a psalm of solution. It's a psalm of breakthrough. It's a psalm of revealing to us what really is the outcome of the endeavors of our life to stay holy and pure in the midst of trials and temptations and difficulties and anxieties and worries and stresses that come uh, around us. <clears throat> as, I, as I studied Psalm 37, can I just be blunt and honest with you? Man, I almost didn't want to preach it. I just thought, oh my goodness, David, one more chapter about my enemies and evildoers and wrongdoers and those who are uh, just just constantly shooting arrows at me. It's just like, David, come on, this is this is chapter thirty-seven. Aren't we on to the victory yet? Aren't we on to the overcoming yet? It was just, you know, and 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 if you've been tracking with me on this, maybe you're understanding what I'm saying. <clears throat> thirty-six psalms and many of them, um, thirty-six before before this. Um, 30, if you were with this last study, we Psalm 36, 1, transgression speaks to the one who's he flatters himself in his own eyes. Uh, he plots trouble while on his his bed. How about 35, even before that? Let not those rejoice who are wrongfully my foes. They speak out against me. It's Psalm 34 it talks about the afflictions of the righteous. It just goes on and on. Psalm 31 is... Is the is the word that Jesus used on the cross into into your hands? I commit my spirit right in the midst of the worst storms. Can you even go back further and see the trajectory and the trend that David was facing in his life? In Psalm two: Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? You would think after thirty six chapters, he would have finally defeated his enemies. He, he there would be that breakthrough victory that we hear about, that breakthrough that the enemies are conquered, and and we'd be like done with it and and going on to uh, better times and and I was getting tired of preaching and and maybe even hearing from these scriptures my enemies are too strong for me I'm overwhelmed how long the lord why do the evil 
prosper. The, <clears throat> the, 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 and it's not just David. You know what the reality probably is, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it you and I as well? Aren't aren't we in in this? We we see politicians today speak to the nation and tell blatant lies and get away and get reelected and the the the, the plans that they laid that were built on lies seem to pass legislation and those lies become part of our national culture. Uh, maybe it's more personal to you. A, a co-worker uh, cheats and and uh, manipulates and is deceptive and gets the promotion. The, the How about the student that plagiarized and you know it and, and they got the better grade and they got more on the top of the class and, and you worked hard and diligent and faithful and, and you just... <clears throat> You're 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 saying these these same things that that David is is saying in this passage of scripture could be frustrating to to have enemies that come at you. It could be in David's case, you know, interesting even more than ours. In David's case, it was actually a physical enemy that came against him. This was not hyperboil. This was not. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this was not David uh, emotionalizing things or uh, using them as a metaphor. When he talked about arrows coming at him, there were people literally shooting arrows at him, spears, um, enemies trying to kill and conquer him. It wasn't relationally killing. It wasn't a, a metaphorical arrow. It was literal. So, <clears throat> so you know, no wonder he spent 37 chapters Talking about the warfare in his life, but but it is also some of these things that David says to us are 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 for our own good as well. Uh, we, we may not have literal arrows, but we may not have the physical, but you can have the relational, where people lie about you or they are angrily speak against you. <clears throat> I have a friend who's been in a very difficult marriage for almost thirty years now, even longer, and uh, the, the the marriage is just contention and difficulty and strife. Uh, and, and it's interesting, the Psalms never says this, but as, as we get to the 37th chapter and we see the same things happening, enemies coming up against us, we realize that our enemies are strong, they are relentless, they are consistent, they are persistent. Some of these battles last a lifetime. Some of these breakthroughs we have are not circumstantial. The circumstances change, the, stays the same. <clears throat> But maybe the victory that we're going to see in here has something more to do with our relationship with Jesus and the preciousness and the ability to stand. That's where you get the title of this message. I'm still standing after all these things that <clears throat> come against me. And, and after reading 37 chapters now and preaching on 37 chapters and teaching you on 37 chapters, uh, <clears throat> you, you can, you can, I can say to myself, I'm, ti- I'm tired of reading it. I'm tired of preaching it. But, you know, how tired of it would be to live it. David lived these things. He was speaking out of his its heart. It's, it's, it, these were real things he was facing. But now in Psalm 37, <laughs> praise the Lord, we see an incredible shift. Uh, <clears throat> almost the, the answer now to the persistent, consistent battles maybe that we're having <clears throat> in our life. And so he says here, as we read in verse 1, fret not yourself because of evildoers nor be envious of wrongdoers. In chapter, in verse 7, the second part, he says, There fret not yourselves from the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. Verse 8, he uses this phrase here now three times, fret not, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It only tends towards evil. <clears throat> David's talking about the evil that's coming against him, and he's saying, don't fret or you will find yourself engaged in the same evil. You'll find yourself angry. You'll find yourself moving towards them in the same aggression they're moving towards you. And God, and certainly in the New Testament, Jesus has a better answer than you to fight fire with fire and anger with anger and and venomous hatred with venomous hatred. Love overcomes evil. Peace overcomes the, the powers of darkness. Joy overcomes the fretting of life. And that's the power of the gospel. Fret not. He gives us the power to do that. Yes, this is a command, but everything that God commands, he empowers to give us. And he's giving you the power right now today as I speak to you. I praise God he's giving you the power to say, I don't have to live in fret. 
I don't have to lay my head down on the pillow with tears in my eyes saying, one more day of suffering, one more day of pain, one more day of physical ailments, one more day of hatred coming against me, one more day of fear of my future. You don't have to do that. Fret not. And particularly in this chapter, fret not because of evildoers and or be envious of wrongdoers. I remember when I was in high school, uh, I was an athlete and I played a couple different sports and and so some of my friends were what they called in those days jocks. You know, they they they, they were the tough kids on, on the campus, and oftentimes it would lend itself towards making fun of the weaker kids or the troubled kids or the outcast or those who looked different or were weak and feeble and <clears throat> in various ways. And <clears throat> so, so some of my friends were making fun of a, a particular group of uh, young men in our school and. And I remember day I joined in with them and mocked these kids and, and laughed at them and made fun of them. And I went home that night, and this this thing, it wasn't actually from Psalm 37, but it was with the Holy Spirit speaking to me. It's like, is that the way you want to live your life? Do you, do you want to join in with the mockers? Do you want to be those who are wrongdoers? And But I was envious. My friends were hip and cool and, you know, the— the, the ones who seemed like they were on top and being on top, they could make fun of those who seemed lower than them. And and I was envious to a degree uh, of that until I realized that that's the, oppos- the total opposite attitude that Jesus Christ had about humbling ourselves and about loving uh, those who are weak and poor and outcast. And, <laughs> and just in the, one night, I remember going home with tears in my eyes and just repenting, saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. I will not join in with those mockers. I will not join in with evildoers. I won't be envious of, of them when they seem to be cool in school. I, and, I, and I just, that night, the Lord changed my heart. And the next few days, I went to school, and I met with those kids that I had made fun of, and I apologized. And I asked them, a lot of them, had, you know, how it is they would sit alone in in, in the lunchroom. <clears throat> and uh, I imagine they'd go home just— I imagine their parents just thought, oh, I feel my heart breaks for my son or my daughter that goes to school and has no friends. And so I, I just started inviting him to sit with me and one of my other friends who was also an athlete, and and he had the same heart as I did, a, a Christian friend. And we started inviting this friend, and we had the most wonderful lunchroom experience and actually became friends with all these guys who were weird and strange and outcast. And we found out they were the most fun and delightful, quirky, different. And there was something about us who maybe and this is going to sound weird but maybe considered a little bit more normal people accepting them in it just kind of gave them a sense that I'm okay uh, I'm, I'm I'm somewhat acceptable and and when we got to share Christ with them what a great joy it was to see the transformation in many of their lives we don't need to be envious of the wrongdoers because they they'll soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb the the the, the uh, being on top of things and being able to mock and ridicule others, it doesn't last long because eventually you get out in the world and you realize you're not all that. You're not all that special. And there might be others, bosses and coworkers that put you down and you find yourself in the same situation. And so the, the <clears throat> Psalm 37 is David finally realizing, <laughs> here's the good news. David, after 37 chapters now, is finally realizing after all these years, after all these trials, after all these battles, after all these difficulties, this consistent onslaught, this persistent pursuit of me, this consistent fretting, the worry, the anxiety, the envy, the strife, the 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 the, the things that the enemy just brought against me, after all these years, I can finally stand here today and say, I'm still standing because God has never let me down because God has never failed me because God has never left me because God has never lost the battle. He's undefeated. He is victorious in every endeavor he has ever undertaken. And one of the endeavors that he's undertaken is to protect me, to provide for me, to bring me through the storm, to bring me through the battle, to bring me through to victory, to cause me to be still standing when my enemies fall all around me. Psalm 37 is a chapter of my enemies falling around me and God allowing me to be still standing. And we're going to see in just a moment, not only standing, but inheriting the land. Who's the left last man standing in the land is the one who inherits the land. And he's going to be telling us in just a moment here in this chapter that he allows us to be the last man standing. Praise God that he's going to allow you 
Yes, you may go through a long-term battle. You may think, where is God? But I tell you what, even in the midst of that battle, he's causing you to stand. And he's teaching us some instruments of our warfare that can cause us to stand in the midst of these battles. Kelly and I, my wife, we have some good friends. They live in Texas, and uh, husband and wife, they've been in ministry for uh, probably 50 years, and they're they're well-known around the country. And she she faced a horrible battle, and my wife and I just went to her funeral last month. And, uh, you know, it was difficult to see the— the <clears throat> The, the length of her struggle. She passed away when she was 75, but when she was 30, she was first diagnosed with cancer, a certain type of cancer and chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, and then a few years of respite, and then another form of cancer attacked her. And, and she battled through that and won the victory over that and went into re, to re, regression. And then uh, some years later, a third type, and <clears throat> then even just maybe five, 10 years before she passed away, uh, a brain tumor, uh, craniology is a very, <clears throat> very horrible, difficult form of surgery that she passed through, and she came out victorious through that. And finally, after 75 years of this battle, she she passed on to be with Jesus. And, and some might look at that life and say, was she still standing? Was, was she, Did she get the victory? Did she overcome? The answer to that question is an absolute, total, unequivocal yes Because through it all, she trusted Jesus. Through it all, she did not fret. Through it all, she was not envious. Like, like, why why are evil people not facing cancer and these multitudes of surgeries? She was doing what verse 3 saying, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Let faithfulness be a friend to you. Not fretting be your friend. Not fear being your friend, but faithfulness being what you befriend. And when you do that, you and you can only do that to be faithful, as being a friend to faithfulness, if you trust in the faithfulness of God, that he is going to see you through. And that's what David's saying in this chapter. After all these battles and how long they've lasted, uh, I'm the one in the land that remains uh, the overcomer, that remains the friend of God. And our friend passing away at 75. She shouldn't have even lived to be that long, but God gave her victory after victory. And part of her victory was her testimony and her faithfulness and her steadfastness and her trust in the Lord and her not fretting and her delighting, verse 4, delighting herself in the Lord and then giving the desires of the heart. That's a powerful um, passage of, uh, of of Scripture there to see the, the delight in the Lord that comes from what he's wanting to, to do in our life. And, and, and just if I could park here for a moment on verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give your, you the desires of your heart. Sometimes we take that wrong and say, okay, I want every delight of my heart. I, I want prosperity and I want a new house and I want a new car and I want a new job and I want a better job and I want a better raise. And these are the desires of my heart. And I, I want a pain-free life and I don't want to be uncomfortable and I want all the creature comforts around me and the materialistic goods around me. Those, those are the delights— uh, of my heart, uh, those are the desires of my heart, and sometimes we take the scriptures and even wrongly accuse God. Lord, you said you'd give me the desires of my heart, and yet I don't have these desires of my heart. Well, it's because we don't take heed to the first part of this pass of this verse: delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. It doesn't say delight yourself in worldliness, delight yourself in materialism. Delight yourself in comfort, delight yourself in ease, delight yourself in pleasure, delight yourself in a pain-free life, and then you'll get all those desires? No, it says delight yourself in the Lord. And when we do this, when we just simply delight ourselves in the Lord, Lord, I delight in you. You're my joy. You're my hope. You're my, you're my victory. You're my passion. You're, 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 you're my heartbeat. You're the apple of my eye. You're, you're, you're the voice I want to hear. You're the commands I want to receive. You're the person that I want to have intimate relationship with, when we delight in the Lord like that, then our desires of our heart change. They become the very things that we're delighting in. I'm delighting in you and knowing you. Now, what do I desire? You're asking me what I want to desire. I want to desire to know you more. I, I, I would delight in knowing you more. I would delight in being nearer to you. I delight to being used by God more. I would delight to have more of anointing. I'd delight to have more love. I'd like to to, to have more faith and confidence in you. When the battles rage, I I, I want to delight in, in in that you'll have me stand through the midst of the storm. 
As we delight in the Lord, those become our desires, and he grants us, he'll give us those desires of our hearts. We are to, verse 5, commit our ways to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He, he will act. Did he, did he act for my friend who's had a long time difficult marriage? Yes, he did, because they befriended faithfulness, and they've grown in the Lord, and they've seen miracles take place. Our friend in Texas, she battled a consistent, persistent storm, and yet the Lord healed her many times and delivered her and gave her a long life where she could say, I'm still standing. And, and the joy is now that she's standing pain-free, seeing the face of Jesus, the one that, that truly she delighted her heart in. And verse 6, and he will bring forth. Now, here's the result that takes place of delighting in the Lord and receiving the desires and fretting not and committing yourself and trusting him. And here's the result of that is he brings forth your righteousness as a light. He's not just bringing forth your prosperity. He's not just bringing forth your your comfort, your ease. He's bringing forth a righteousness in you and I that, that the world doesn't know anything about, that very few people ever see in their lifetime a truly righteous person. And here David is speaking about becoming a righteous person who's been through the storms and the battles and is fretting not and is worried not and is fearful not and is befriending faithfulness and is delighting in the Lord and is committing his desires to God and committing his way to the Lord and he's trusting him and he knows God is going to act on his behalf and all of a sudden righteousness comes flooding David's heart. And we've already read verse 7 and 8 where he's talking about fret not and refrain from anger because it'll cap- capture your heart into into these evil ways. And, and the, these are such precious promises from the Lord as, as he calls us to move into the things that he has for us. I, I wrote a list up. I, I think this would be interesting to you. I wrote a list of, because this chapter is so long, I, I really won't have the time today to get into every verse like we've done in most of the chapters. But, but it describes the wicked. And you're going to see something in here about this question, are they still standing? Verse 2 says, they fade and wither. Verse 9 says, they are cut off. Verse 10, soon they shall be no more. Look carefully for them and you won't even find them. Verse 13 says, that evil man, his day is coming. Verse 15, the sword that they draw goes into their own hearts. The bow that they move towards you will be broken. Not only will their bow be broken, verse 17 says that their arms will be broken. Isn't that a powerful picture? First, he breaks the bow and they're trying to fix it. And he goes, oh, okay, if you're going to keep trying to get that bow and arrow, uh, after my children, then I break your arms. Your arms will be broken. Verse 20, uh, the, they, they will perish and they will vanish. They're, they're not even going to be known. They're not, they're not even thinking about them anymore. The, verse 22, the curse will be cut off. Verse 28, they will be cut off. That's the third time the, the, speaking of this thing being cut off. Verse 33, they will be abandoned. They will be condemned in a trial where the righteous will not be condemned when the evil bring them before trial. You still will be standing in your righteousness. Verse 36, they passed away and they are no more. We sought for them and we could not find them. Verse 38, they are altogether destroyed. Fourth time now mentioning they are cut off. <laughs> Who wants to be envious of those, that type of life? The the the, the short live, the grass growing up. Uh, rapidly into prosperity and to fame and fortune and success and and glory, self glory, and then, but it's quickly cut off and it's no more and it's just written off in history as having no <clears throat> value. A bad name is given to those people if they're remembered at all. Here's a contrast in Psalm 37 of the godly compared to the wicked. Verse four: They are given the desire of their heart; they delight in the Lord. Verse five: He will act on their behalf. Verse six. He will bring forth righteousness and justice in their life. Verse 11, they will become meek and delight in abundant peace. Verse 17, the Lord will uphold them. Verse 18, their heritage is is forever and ever. Verse 19, they will not be put to shame in famine. They will have abundance. Verse 23, though he fall, he will not be cast headlong. He's going to be standing at the end of the day. Verse 24, the Lord upholds. Verse 25, he never forsakes. 26, his children, their, their children become a blessing. Verse 27, they're, they're, they and their children will dwell in the land forever. The, this idea of they're still standing isn't just for you, but you'll pass this blessing on to the next generation and to your children and to your children's children. Verse 28, he will not forsake you. Verse 29, the law will be in our heart 
the steps, our steps will not slip. Verse 33, we will not be abandoned to the evil powers and we will not be condemned at trial. Verse 34, he will exalt you. Verse 37, there's a future for you. Verse 38, we see that the Lord is our stronghold. In verse 40, the Lord helps, delivers, and saves. Hallelujah. What a great difference between these two things. And now a question might arise to you. How do we make sure we become those who stand on this side of righteousness and obtain all these blessings? And we don't fret to the point of of uh, tending our own selves to evil. Well, there are certain commands in this chapter that are so powerful. And these are the children of God delighting in the law of the Lord, following, befriending faithfulness in these steps of obedience. These are a call to obedience. And in our culture today, obedience is frowned upon. And even in the churches today, we're speaking so much of a of a sloppy type of grace that has no teeth to it, has no power of the Spirit behind it, and therefore obedience has become out of vogue even in the church today. It doesn't matter to you or I because we want this righteousness that God's talking about in Psalm 37 here. And here's what we're called to obey in verse 1. Fret not and don't be envious. All right? And again, you may be thinking, well, how do I not fret? This is the power of the Holy Spirit. You come to the Lord honestly and say, I'm, I'm fretting, I'm envious, I'm striving, I'm not delighting in the Lord, I'm not committing my way to Him, I'm not trusting in Him. And that's confession before the Lord. Oftentimes, the, the prior power that opens up the door to obedience is confession of our lack of obedience, even our lack of desire to obey, even our, our, even our, 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 our lack of knowledge of how to obey it, 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 it comes from this place of repentance. God, I want to obey you. My heart sees this as the glorious way. My heart is being drawn to you to obey. It's not just that I'm a good person and I want to obey. This is a, you're putting that longing, that drive in my heart to be faithful and obedient to you. And so verse 1, fret not, don't be envious. <clears throat> verse 3, trust and do good. Uh, verse 3 really helps us with verse 1. If we trust we, we, we find ourselves really not fretting anymore. Why would I fret if I trust that everything's going to be okay, that God is going to protect me, he's going to watch over me, he's going to be causing me to be a man standing in the last days. Verse 4, to delight in the Lord, to, to, to not delight in a pain-free life, to not delight in other things, or to, to delight in what the world delights in, but delight in the preciousness of Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us on the cross, forgiving our sin. Delight in these things and remember them. Remember, if, if you're facing the pain of, of an onslaught that is persistent and consistent, doesn't seem to go away, you're like David, 36 chapters into this, and I'm still facing all kinds of enemies. If you're like that, just, just Lord, Lord, I want to delight in you. I want to remember, the, the instead of thinking about, well, my job's not going well, and my health isn't that good, just think, Jesus, you saved me. Your, your blood cleansed me. You washed away all of my sins. You gave me a, a, you know, an imputed righteousness that is Christ now living in me. You filled me with the Holy Spirit. You've given me wisdom and truth and freedom and victory. Uh, how many things can you give thanks to the Lord for? That's delighting in him. Then committing. After delight and trust comes a commitment. Lord, I'm, I'm committing myself to not fret. and tr- I'm committing myself to trust. I'm committing myself to light. I'm committing myself to you. Verse 7 says, be still. Wait patiently for the Lord and fret not. This being, being still is, and waiting is the sense of even in the midst of the conditions not changing and the arrow still being shot, my heart is still and waiting because I know the promise of the Lord that he will not leave me nor forsake me. And this battle will come to an end and I will stand victorious in the last day. Verse 8. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath, fret not again. He's saying to fret not again. Verse 21, be generous. Verse 26, uh, ever lending to others. Verse 27, trust, uh, excuse me, turn away from evil and do good. Verse 28, let your mouth speak justice and wisdom. Verse 31, um, put uh, the law in your heart. And verse 34, repeating one of the early verses, wait for the Lord. These are precious uh, commandments of the Lord that position us to be to befriending faithfulness in such a way that causes our heart to do these things that we want to do to trust and to love and to delight in the Lord. All right, the last few minutes I have with you, there's a, there's a phrase that's repeated in Psalm 37 over and over again. 
And I tell you what, man, if you will understand this, you will be able to delight. You'll be able to deli- to, to, to to dwell in the land. You'll be able to commit. You'll be able to trust. You'll be able to not fret. And that's the understanding that he says, you, uh, as a promise from your Father God, are going to inherit the land. If you remember, Jesus taught about this in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 5 and when he stood up on the mountain and gave the Beatitudes. And one of those attitudes was the, the, the meek will inherit the earth. And really all of those attitudes, the, the, the peacemakers and, and those who are humble, the, the, these are the people. It's, it's, a, it's a contradictory kingdom. You would think it would be the brash and the, the venomous and the, the bold and the, the, those who push their own agenda would inherit the land. Uh, but God has a counterintuitive kingdom. His kingdom says to us, those fade, those die, those d- no longer dwell in the land. But you, I'm going to let you inherit the land. And five times in this passage, five times, one times he says dwell in the land, but five times he says you're going to inherit the land. You're not just going to dwell in it, but it's going to become yours. What's going to become yours? The trust, the faith, the patience, the power, the love, the grace, the, the persistence, the, the overcoming, the, the, the ability to stand strong no matter what's coming around you. That's what you're going to inherit. And the land speaks of, of putting your firm foot down and standing on the promises of God. This is not just a promise of heaven, although that's part of it. And what a great joy that's going to be when we don't have any contention, any strife, any enemies coming against us at all. They'll all be cast out forever and ever into the, the lake of fire. And, but yet, Psalm 27, for instance, says, says the, you'll inherit in the land of the living. Isn't that good? It's not just a promise of eternal things to come. But even now in the Psalm 27 promises, in the land of the living, you're going to see the glory of the Lord, the promises of the Lord coming true. And <clears throat> so five times we see this. Let me just briefly go through these. The first one is found in verse eight and nine. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself. It only tends to evil. For be, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. The number one way to inherit the land is waiting on the Lord not taking things into your own account. You remember in the Old Testament, King Saul, he didn't want to wait on the command from from the prophet Samuel. uh, And so he made sacrifices himself. He did not wait. He moved in his own fleshly strength and energy, trying to overcome his enemies in his own power. If he would have waited on the Lord, he could have kept his kingdom, but, but, but he didn't. And so he did not inherit the land. His kingdom was taken from him, but those who wait for the Lord, here's a promise. It's not they might, they it says they shall inherit the land. Learn to wait on the Lord. Take take every morning, even if it's in your car driving to work on the subway. Take take every morning if you can take five minutes alone on a in a chair in your living room or even in your bedroom. Uh, maybe maybe it's the first thing you do and you wake up. Maybe some of you grab the phone and want to check the weather and the news and your calendar for the day. But maybe just pick up your Bible for three or four or five minutes and just, just ask, Lord, I'm here to wait on you. I'm going to get peace from this. I'm going to breathe in the delight of the Lord. I'm going to position myself humbly before you. Maybe it'd be best even if you got on your knees beside your bed and said, Lord, I'm positioning myself in waiting humbly before you and not fretting over what's going on around the world, not spending all my energy listening to the news and the trouble of what's happening in the Democratic or the Republican Party or the, the things that are happening in the courts. Lord, I'm going to position myself and waiting on you and believing that you're going to cause righteous people to stand in these days. <clears throat> Number two, it says in verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Exactly out of the mouth of Jesus later, Matthew chapter 5, the meek. Again, it's, it's the meek and the people who are waiting on the Lord do so because they're meek. They don't think their power is sufficient in their own energies. They don't think they can work through the and resolve the conflicts of their life. So they wait on the Lord, and this meekness is a humility, and it's 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 so wanting in our generation. Humility is is something that's looked down upon, rather than being the glorious trait that it truly is. Even in the pulpits today and in churches today, we see people striving for fame and success, notoriety, popularity, numbers of followers, size of their church, size of their ministry, size of their TV programs, how many radio stations they're on, how many books they've sold. It's the opposite of meekness. Meekness is is deflecting things from yourself and looking upon others 
blessing others, trusting God fully that he'll see you through, that you don't have to promote. You don't have to blow your own horn, your own trumpet before your good works. You know that just you can walk in this preciousness of of a, a meek spirit. Number three is found in verse 21 through 26. Would you allow me to read that, please? The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is, hallelujah, generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, those, but those cursed of him shall be cut off. Uh, and then down to verse 25, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have seen, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Verse 26, he is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. One of the ways to hurt the land is not just waiting or meekness, but it's, it's other centeredness. It's not focusing on your own need, your own problem, your own crisis, your own pain. Your prayers are no longer just praying about what I need and where my breakthroughs I want to come through and through the blessings I want the Lord to give me. This generosity is not just a financial generosity. It's a it's a giving of time and energy and servanthood and even prayer. Lord, I'm praying for others, not just for myself. And the righteous is generous and they give. He's ever lending generously. It's, it's, it's a life being poured out. Uh, a person who doesn't wait, a person who is pri- proudful rather than humble, will never be a generous person. You might say, I want to tithe, and I want to give, and I want to give to missions. It will never happen unless you find yourself being uh, uh, humbled before the Lord, and then out of that springs this generous. And as it's said so many times, you cannot give God. God will bless back. And that's not just because he wants you to say, okay, I'll be generous. You know, I, I have uh, tenfold. And I'll be generous with that, and then I'll have 20-fold, so I'm better off now. I have more. No, that 20-fold now becomes, I can be generous now with 20-fold. That becomes 40. Oh, I can be generous with 40. And then the increase that God gives when, when he blesses us back, uh, that, that, uh, that, that even goes down to our children uh, become a blessing. We can give away generously to other people. That's generous. Number four is found in verse 28 and 29. For the Lord loves justice. And he will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. Those who inherit the land are those who have pure speech. They they speak of things that are true and righteous and 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 edifying and for the building up for for the blessing of others, and it's, but it's also speaking of the truth against what is evil and what is wicked. It's, it's standing against the things even in our own nation that are an abomination to the Lord, the sexual perversion, the, the murder of children, the mutilation of children, and the transgender agenda that's taking place in, in America, the, the, the teaching is in our schools the, of such a horrible liberal view of the world, that the biblical worldview is just being almost brainwashed away from a generation. We we speak truth against those things. It's pure speech. It's righteous speech. It's the tongue that speaks justice. And these are the people that will inherit the land. There's going to be benefit from you speaking truth. There's going to be benefit from you being empowered into the things that God has you to say to your generation. And th- this this is the, the blessing of the Lord. The last one is found in verse 34. And this is the la- the fifth time it says inherit the land and it says wait for the Lord and keep his ways and he will <clears throat> exalt you uh, and uh, and says and you will look upon the wicked and uh, I have seen the wicked and ruthless man spreading himself like a green tree but he passed away. I saw it for him mark the blameless man and behold the upright for there is a future for the man of peace. This last one is what I talked about earlier. This is an obedient man. He's blameless. He's upright. He's and this man and this man has a future. I want to say today, this man, this woman can be you. You can be the one who can say, I have a future. God has a future for me. God has a plan for me. God has my steps ordered. God has his protective power. He's going to cause me, no matter what's going on around me, he's going to cause me to stand in the midst of all these battles. In conclusion, I'm saying to you today, life is hard. Life can be cruel. Life certainly is dangerous. It is filled with uh, attacking enemies on our left and our right, in front of us and behind us. We we often uh, see people around us who are prospering, even though they're 
They're evil and wicked, and they could cause our heart to fret. And you may have faced, this is what this message is saying to you today in in closing, you may have faced an extended, unyielding, consistent, persistent, ongoing, extreme battle of enemies attacking you, but you in Christ Jesus are still standing. You will not be defeated. You will not be overcome. You will not be destroyed. You will not be cut off. You will not be forgotten. You are going to inherit the land here, even in the land of the living, and in eternity with Jesus Christ, you're going to find comfort and joy and overcoming. Your enemies, eventually they're just going to wither like grass, but you're going to grow like a tree of righteousness. This is not my opinion. This is not David's opinion. This is the word of the Lord. And he's telling us in here, trust in the Lord. Commit your way to him because this is the outcome of those who do that. Father, we pray a blessing now on all listeners, everyone who's right now in a place of struggle, And maybe it's been a long struggle, years of battling cancer, years of a difficult marriage, years of of discouragement of in their employment and their careers, years of of discouragement and in in maybe battles they've had in the flat with the flesh. But Lord, I thank you that as we follow your principles and obey your commands, and trust in the Lord and delight in you, that that you will make our way straight and you'll cause us to stand in these 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 difficult days. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, you'll raise up a standard against him, and we will find ourselves inheriting the land. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Grace and peace to you.